Amen. Good singing tonight. Good to be here. It is a beautiful day. Amen. Maybe we ought to, for days like this, build this little pavilion outside and just have church outside. That'd be nice. That would be nice. Um, some prayer requests that I've got for everybody tonight. Of course, we want to pray uh, for Frankie's uh, family. He had two sisters and a brother, if I remember right, and uh, they're all coming in from different places. Um, I think they are going to ask me to speak at the service, and I said, I'm honored to do that. Um, I preached Eddie's funeral, I preached um, uh, Stan's funeral, and, um, and it, it's, it is my pleasure to, uh, to minister to these guys, both while they are here and then once they graduate and get to go home. It's our pleasure, and I told the man I talked to yesterday, I said, our church will, will do anything uh, for the family, and if there's anything that we can do, we will do. And so uh, we don't know any arrangements yet, uh, but as soon as I hear something, well, then I'll post it on our website, get it out on Twitter, and, and so on, and let everybody know. And um, I think, though, that it is going to be at Vineyard's Funeral Home, and I think they already have that arranged, so uh, as soon as I know, I'll, I'll uh, let everybody know. But pray for uh, Frankie's family and lift them up. Um, my... Uh, I have a cousin out in Atlanta. Um, her name is Kim. Her husband passed away. He was in poor health. He passed away. My mom uh, is headed down there Friday. She's going to fly down there. And uh, I talked to my aunt, Mary Jo and Uncle Juan, and uh, told them that we would be praying for them. And so just uh, remember them uh, in your prayers. Uh, pray for Alicia. They talked her into getting one of those shots in the back that I got that I wanted to die when I got it, and that's where she is right now. And I, I hope it ends up better for her than it did for me, so just pray for her and lift her up. Lindsay has got some uh, problems that she's having looked into as far as her back is concerned. And uh, I feel great. Uh, from my back surgery, I really do, and I thank God for that. Appreciate everybody's prayers. So just um, just pray for them. All right. Who has a prayer request tonight? Go ahead, Sister Helen. Okay. Oh. Okay, pray for them, and uh, pray that if they don't know the Lord, they will before they go. Yes, Heather. That is amazing, because he OD'd, and he was dead, okay? And he came out of it, and... Talk about God knocking you down to wake you back up. If he doesn't get his heart right with God, I don't know that I would I don't know that I would wait for God to give me another chance like that. Amen. So pray for him. Okay? Brett Henderson, and I've known him for a long time, and he is uh, Roy, I mean he has been dealing with these drugs and alcohol all his life, and he needs to be saved. And so pray for him, that, he, that God will save him, okay? His daddy was saved, his mama was saved, his grandma and grandpa were saved. He needs to be saved, amen? So just pray for Brad Henderson, lift him up. I, that, that floored me, okay? All right, who else got a prayer request? Yes, Melissa. Lost family members. Who's got lost family members? We're going to pray for them tonight. Okay. Pray for Laura. She had root canals done. Why would anybody go on purpose and have a root canal done? Two of them. Amen. Yes, ma'am.
Okay. All right. Pray for her that she'll ask the Lord. Yes, hope. Mosquito bites and bumps. It'll get much worse later on. Yes, Liam. Okay. I don't know what he said, but we'll pray for it anyway. All right. Go ahead, Caleb. Okay. Uh, if you have a prayer list tonight, take a look at it and find some people on there that you just think you just need to pray for and lift them up, all right? Who's got just something on their heart they're going to pray about tonight? All right. You folks online, you pray with us. We're streaming tonight for the first time. We're streaming on Sermon Audio. We're streaming on Facebook. And we're streaming on YouTube. Okay? Three places. Okay? And that's... The Apostle Paul always went where the people were. And that's where they are. Okay? And uh, there's a... I've, I've got it in my mind that if all the weirdos are going to be on YouTube saying stupid stuff, I want to be across the street giving them Bible. Okay? Let people have a choice. Let people hear both sides and let them make a decision. Let them make a choice. Amen? All right. Let's come in and pray tonight. It's good to have everybody here tonight. It's good to have everybody online. We appreciate you. Father in heaven, we want to come before you tonight and just say thank you, Lord, for being a very good God to us. We thank you, Lord, that your power is shown in the heavens. Lord, it was a blessing to see what we saw the other day. We thank you for it, God. Lord, it just it displays your power and your awesomeness. God, this, this world is what you created. It's not what just happened. You have a purpose for everything. You have a purpose for bringing the moon into the sun's light and the sun's path. And Father, we thank you, Lord, for displaying your awesome power. The heavens truly do declare uh, your handiwork and your creation. And Father, we thank you for that. We're encouraged by it. Lord, we understand, God, that if you are powerful enough to guide the motion, of the sun, the moon, and all the stars, if you're powerful enough, Lord, to cause day and night. Lord, that you're in charge of even all the beasts of the field, all the birds of the air, and all the fish of the sea. Then, Father, there's not anything in our life that is outside of your control. And, Father, we just ask for your blessing and your grace, dear God. Give us comfort tonight to know that everything truly is in your hands, and you're very capable, and you're very good God to your children. And Father, what worries we have, what uh, anxiety, Lord, that we have, what depression we have. Days, Father, when we're just down, days where we think we're not going to make it. Lord, help us to lift up our eyes and see that sunrise. And to watch the moon and the stars, that your handiwork, your creation. And to know, God, that you are powerful enough and there are, there is nothing that you can't do. Father, I pray for these that have lifted up their hand tonight. Lord, they're just calling out to you for various needs in their life, and I pray, Lord, that you would help them. Lord, for these that are watching online, Lord, and the needs that are in their life, we ask you, God, to bless them, and we thank you, Lord, for bringing them in our direction tonight. I pray, dear God, that the gospel that they hear tonight would be sufficient for the needs that are in their life. Father, I pray that you would bless my family. Father, be with my aunt and uncle, my cousin, my mother, and all those, Lord, who grieve. I pray, God, that you would... I thank you, Lord, that he knew you. And I just pray, Heavenly Father, you would just bless them, give them that comfort of knowing that it is truly, Lord, a precious sight when one of your saints is called home. I pray, Lord, that you'd bless my family. Father, bless this church. Lord, be with the needs that are on their heart. Father, bless all the widows in our church, all the ladies in our church that have lost their husbands. Father, we thank you, Lord, that they all knew you, and we know, Lord, where they are. But, Father, we sure miss them. Lord, we just pray, dear God, that you would just bless us and bless these wives. 
Lord, and be for them what they need in the absence of their husband. And Father, I thank you for blessing my life with Frankie. I love him. I thank you for him. I thank you, Lord, that he considered me his friend. And I thank you, dear God, for giving him his new body. One that doesn't need a wheelchair. One that doesn't need a shot. One that is with you today. I thank you for that. I thank you, Lord, for the blessing of having these guys in our church. I pray, dear God, that you'd bless every one of them. Bless the workers that work with them, and we thank you for them. Lord, it truly is a labor of love that they have there. And I've seen them at work, and I've seen how they work with these guys, Lord, and I thank you for them. Pray that you'd just continue to bless them and bless our church, Lord, with these great, wonderful men. And Father, we just ask God that you guide our hearts tonight as we study your word, open up our eyes and help us to see wondrous things tonight, things that will help us, things that will bless us. Father, use us for your glory and your kingdom's sake, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. <clears throat> oh, yeah. That was the first thing that we noticed when it started getting really dark out, the cicadas. Uh, my wife said they were frogs. I said, no, hun, those are not frogs. Those are cicadas. And uh, I used to think they were crickets. And crickets are pretty can, upside of cicada. Cicada is one of the ugliest, uh, creepy creatures that I've ever seen in my life. They are, I mean, their eyes are just wicked looking. But anyway, they, as soon as it started getting real dark, boy, I mean, they started singing their song. And uh, it only lasted, a, you know, about 20 minutes, and they figured, oh, it's light again. Okay, go back to sleep. And, uh, yeah, that was neat. It was just an interesting, interesting event that took place, and, and I, I am. I'm thankful uh, for being able to see that, and it, it, it does display the handiwork of God. That, that's not just, listen, I said this the other day. The fact that the sun is exactly 400 times bigger than the moon, and yet... They are, they appear as they are the same size. Okay, if you measure the circle of the moon, the circle of the sun, they're the same size. And that's because the sun is precisely 400 times farther away than the moon is from us. Okay, now those numbers are not accidental. They're, it's there and it's done that way on purpose. I believe in a God that set forth the motion of the sun and the moon and the stars and he established them and they're going to continue to do that until there is no more time and then in the new heaven and the new earth there's there's the light of the sun is not going to be needed because we're going to have the light of God and the glory of God that just that just blesses my heart all of these were brought about by the word of God first Peter chapter 1 turn there we uh, have been dealing with uh, uh, First Peter, and uh, I told you it was going to take a little while to get through this book. That's because that's, that's how I like to run through things. Okay, let's, let's get every piece of meat off the chicken bone before we put it back in the plate. Amen? Make sure there's nothing left. And then, lo and behold, if we go back and did another study on First Peter, we'd find things we never saw the first time. And so anyway, First Peter chapter 1. Verse 15, the two incorruptible things that are part of our salvation. Number one is the blood. Number two is the word. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. For as much as ye know that you were not redeemed with corruptible Things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, 
who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead. You believe God raised Jesus up from the dead, don't you? Amen. Amen. Then believe that Frank has a new body. Okay? Ron, our buddy Frank is not in a wheelchair anymore. He does not need medicine for diabetes anymore. And he is healthy and alive and better than he ever was. Okay? Just trust God. That's why we're here tonight. Amen? We trust God. And that is made possible because God's promises are incorruptible. God does not turn back on His Word. God does not send His Word out, give you His Word, and then withdraw it and say to you, Well, you messed up, and I can't, I'm not going to save you anymore. That is not what God does. So, uh, verse... Um, Let's go to verse uh, 22. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Let me give you another verse here where Paul said, For the word is quick, and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. That word quick does not mean that he's real fast at pulling it out. That word quick is an old, old English word that means alive. The word, is, it says it there, that's quick. And then it says it here. But if incredible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. I don't know if I've ever told you all this, but in my casket, with me, I want my Bible. Now, I, I, I know that while I'm laying in the grave, I'll not be reading it. Okay? Because there'll be no light in there. But I want people to see the testimony that I believe that God's word abides with us forever. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And he hasn't. If you are in a place where you feel like God is not near you, then you just walk over and get real close to your Bible and open it up and start reading it. And God is as close as the words that you're reading on those pages. That's how close he is. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. All right? So it says, incorruptible, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. I want you to take your Bible and turn to Isaiah chapter 40. Now, uh, some of you, that, what I'm going to say right now, I don't have in my notes, but I just feel led to say it. And some of you have already heard this uh, already. But for the sake of maybe some people on, uh, on uh, sermon audio that has not heard this before, maybe for the sake of some people on uh, uh, Facebook or YouTube that has never heard this, I want to assure you just how right God is in what He said. Because what I was taught at an earlier age was the Bible, written on those original parchments, those original manuscripts, as they were copied, as, they were, as those manuscripts over time, they got old, they decayed, and they fell apart, and they made new copies. And, and then after, after a while, some of those words got left out, or some of those words got corrupted, or they didn't, they didn't quite make it from this page to the new page, and so on. And so, and so I heard... That over time, the original word of God became corrupt. That it's got errors in it. That some words that are in your Bible, according to the scholars, shouldn't be there. Or some of the words that are there um, shouldn't be there. Or some words that should be there are not there because it fell into corruption. And for a while, I, I, I guess I believed that. But then I started thinking about what God said. And I don't believe that anymore. Okay? So Isaiah 40... He says, uh, verse 6, the voice said, cry, and he said, what shall I cry? And he said, all flesh is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, 
and the flower fadeth because the spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. Now, grass withers. Here before we had all this rain, our grass withered. It was shriveled up. It was dried up. It turned brown. Our life fades away. People die. We're going to die. Our ancestors are all dead. They shriveled up just like the grass and they faded away. But here's what God's teaching you now. He says, um, all this in verse 8, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Now let me show you what this means. I'm going to show you how wise God is and how he knows how everything's going to turn out. It just so happens that when Isaiah, Jeremiah, Moses, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, Peter, when these guys were writing the words that God was giving them to write concerning his word, they were writing on two different types of material. The first one was called um, vellum. Vellum, they would take the skin of a sheep or a goat. They would, they would strip all the hair off of it. And they would get it all tanned and get it real thin and everything like that. And they would write the words that they had on this vellum, on this animal skin, on flesh. Is what they wrote it on. They literally wrote it on flesh. The other thing they used was called papyrus. It's where we get the word paper from. Paper that we use is made from wood fiber. Well, the paper they use, there was this big, tall reed, this big, tall grass that grew, and they would take that thing and they would chop it down. And, you know, grass is, grows in layers. It, it kind of folds over itself in layers. Well, they took this, this reed and they, they cut it down and they separated out all those layers and then they wove them together, just like you would weave you know, thread together, they wove and interlaced these layers of this grass together. Then they would set it out and they would dry it. And by the time it was dried, they had what they called papyrus. And so they wrote on flesh and they wrote on grass. Look at your Bible. The grass withereth, all flesh is grass. So they wrote it on flesh and they wrote it on grass. And after about a hundred or so years, that grass started withering up. The papyrus started crumpling, started getting holes in it. We have copies of old copies of the Bible. And they're all tattered. The edges are tattered. There's holes in them because they dried up. They shriveled. The wind blew on them. The sun beat on them. And they shriveled up and dried away. Just like the animal skin, the flesh that they wrote it on. It started to shrivel up. And uh, you've seen old leather. Haven't you? Old books that were made out of leather, two, three hundred years old. That leather just starts turning to dust and it just falls apart. That's what happens. And God knew that. God knew that whether they wrote his words on grass or flesh, he knew that both of those were going to decay. But God was not concerned because God said, when you see the grass wither, and you see the flower fadeth away, don't worry. Because I will always preserve the words that were on those. I will make sure that I find a way to preserve the word of the Lord. Doesn't matter if the original parchments faded away. Doesn't matter if the copies are all tattered and torn. God preserved every word that he spoke to Moses, to Abraham, to Elijah, to Enoch... To um, give me some others. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, Paul, James, Jude. All of those guys. Every word God swore that he would preserve them. Amen. Doesn't matter if it was flesh or grass. He knew they were going to wither. But he said, don't worry, I'll preserve my words. Pass those originals. Think about it. Adam is dead. Been dead for thousands of years. And yet, abiding in every living human being is Adam's seed. Doesn't matter if it's in you, or him, or her, or you, or you. 
We are all the seed of Adam and Adam's seed, his word, his book, his DNA still continues to this very day because all flesh is grass. Adam died, he's withered away. We'll never find Adam's body. It's turned to dust. That's what God said would happen. We're not going to find Moses' body anywhere. We're not going to find the bodies of the saints of people who lived 4,000 years ago. We're not going to find their bodies because they all withered away. And yet their seed is still alive and present in every human being on this planet. God knows how to preserve, doesn't he? So if you believe that God can preserve his words, surely God, when you place your soul in God's hands, God knows how to keep you, doesn't he? God keeps you better than you keep yourself sometimes. That's, see, that's why we trust God and we don't trust us anymore. We trust what God said. So, the seed then becomes incorruptible. Doesn't matter how it was written, when it was written. We trust that every single word that God said is incorruptible. Now, I don't remember where I left off last week. So I'm just going to pick a spot here. Because every one of these verses are pretty much the same. Let me start just let me start let me start back in Psalm 119. Everybody turn your Bible to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. That'd be a good place to start. There is a lot in Psalm 119. If you ever have doubts about God's word, turn to Psalm 119. And by the time you read verse 176, you shouldn't be doubting anymore. It shouldn't take that long. But I promise you, by the time you get to the last 176 verses of Psalm 119, you'll just say, you know what? I believe the Bible's still around. I believe God's word is true. In verse 34, 34, I meant to say 44. Verse 44, so shall I keep thy law continually forever and ever. Now think about it. God preserved his word in the people that he gave his word to. Because that's what that says. So shall I keep thy law continually forever and ever. You know what I think it means? You know, some people say, well, it tells us to keep the commandments, right? You know what I, maybe I just think different. Now, I know that I can't 100%, absolutely, totally obey the commandments of God 100% of the time, day in, day out. I know I can't. I try. Try hard. But I know I can't. But he tells us to keep his commandments, right? Okay? So, Caleb, come up here. Come up here, young man. He said, pick Caleb. I didn't pick John. I was worried about it. Caleb, I give you 10 bucks if you can get this Bible out of my hands. Come on, 10 bucks. 15 bucks. Come on. 20 bucks. $25. If you can get this book out of my hand. And remember, I've had surgery, right? Huh? Thirty dollars. If you can get this book out of my hands. Thirty-five dollars. Are you done? Yeah. All right. The grass withereth, right? Somebody give Caleb thirty-five dollars for his effort. He don't want your applause. He wants thirty-five dollars. Well, he tried. Don't ask asked me to give away God's commandments. I'm going to keep them. Don't ask me to hand in my Bible. Don't ask me to stop believing it. Don't put a gun to my head and say, renounce the Bible and I'll let you live. Pull the trigger. Because I'm going to keep commandments of God. And nobody is going to take those out of my heart again. Even if you succeed in stealing all my Bibles. See, I've already hid the word in my heart. 
and it's there, and it's not going anywhere. Amen? You see, I grew up believing the Bible, and then I went to Bible college. And I left Bible college not really believing the Bible like I used to. And then God brought me to a time where he convinced me that it was right. And now, see, I've had that rebirth of that. It's not going anywhere. It's solid. You can't take it from me. So in that sense, yes, I am keeping God's word. Nobody's taken it away from me. So how did God preserve his word? He used the people that he could count on and the people that he trusted to keep that word. Is that you? Amen. Uh, verse 89, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Verse 152, Concerning thy testimonies, I have known of old that thou hast founded them forever. That means that once they were founded, once they were established, they are going to be forever. They're not temporary. Don't give me this nonsense about, well, that's you know, only in the original manuscripts. That is not what it says. Doesn't matter if it's a copy, a copy, a copy, or a translation of a copy. He founded them forever. Psalm 119, 160. Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. Verse, uh, Psalm 146, verse 5. Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, which made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that therein is, which keepeth truth forever. Proverbs 12, 19. I'm going to move through some of this. Just kind of go verse to verse to verse to verse. Because then we're going to hit on a little bit different subject. So I'm going to move kind of fast. Proverbs 12, 19. The lip of truth shall be established forever. Ecclesiastes 3, 14. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. And nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it that men should fear before him. If that, if, like I said, I said this last week, I remember I talked about this last week. If there was a verse that you needed to establish in your mind and your heart and then to help somebody else believe what it is you believe, Ecclesiastes 3.14, in my opinion, is the verse. It says, whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nobody can add to it. Nobody can take away from it ever. That's the verse right there. Uh, let's see here. Let's look at Luke 4, 4. Jesus answered him saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Luke 4, 4. You might want to make a note. Because the King James, which is what we all use here, is the only Bible in English that has the last part of Luke 4, 4, but by every word of God. That last part has been omitted from the NIV, the New American Standard, the Message Bible, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, the Revived Standard, the New English Version, the English Standard Bible, and on and on and on. It's been omitted. So read that verse. Jesus answered saying, It is written that man should not live by bread alone. In those new Bibles, it, that verse stops right there and omits that last part. Man should not live by bread alone. Okay, how then shall we live? By every word of God. Now think about it. These are the people who don't believe that we have every word of God. And think about it. The devil doesn't want you to believe that we live by every word of God. So that verse mysteriously missing out of all the new Bibles. 1 Peter 1, 23, that's our, that's our text. Uh, 2 John 1, 2, For truth's sake which dwell in us shall be with us forever. Uh, Psalm 40. Now here we're going to kind of change keys a little bit here. A preserved word preserves those who trust in it. Okay? Do you want to go to heaven when you die? When are you going to die? You don't know. So what you have done is that you have set your trust in the Lord. Saying to God, God, you keep me. God, you preserve me. 
You hold me fast so that no man can take me out of your hand. That's what Jesus said. No man can pluck him out of his hand. That applies to those who put their trust in him. You don't trust God? What are you going to do? Trust yourself? What are you going to do? Trust me? You trust religion? Trust preachers? TV preachers? Okay? You've got to trust what God said. It's the only thing that's going to be right 100% of the time. Psalm 40, verse 11. Withhold not thou thy tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let thy loving kindness, kindness and thy truth continually preserve me. How long? Continually. Psalm 61, 7. He shall abide before God forever. O prepare mercy and truth which may preserve him. Truth preserves. Lies corrupt. Use the analogy again. You've got a jar of jelly in the fridge that's been there since Reagan was in office. You got a jar of jelly that you just bought. You pour the old, get the old jar of jelly out and open it up. It's got all kinds of stuff that you didn't buy in it. You don't put the brand new jelly in the corrupt jelly thinking that the brand new jelly will clean up the corrupt jelly. What will happen? You're going to ruin the new jelly. Right? Think about it. Here's our salvation... And we're going to use something that we have been told is corrupt to give us that salvation. What we, instead of the corrupt, instead of us or our salvation making the Bible right, that corrupt Bible has done nothing but corrupt our salvation. See, it's the incorruptible seed, the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. We don't, I'll use this illustration, zombie Bibles. You know what zombies are, right? They're dead, alive people. Something's happened and now they've got half their bodies all corrupt and maggots all in it and they're walking around and they want to eat your head or something, eat your brain, okay? It's the zombie. It's what every zombie movie is about, okay? Well, here's zombie Bibles. They're corrupt. But they tell you that it's still good. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Okay? It's got to be 100. God's version of pure means it's 100% pure. No corruption in it. Proverbs 20, 28. Mercy and truth preserve the king. Proverbs 2, verse 8. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints. What is the way that you and I are walking in? It's right here. He said that he would preserve the way of his saints. Okay? Sterling, I get tickled at him because he always has problems with his GPS, his Garmin. And probably what the deal is, is that they, they loaded the map in that thing 10 years ago. And he still got it. And you know that in the last 10 years... Well, in the last 10 years, they put New 21 there in Hillsboro. That's not going to show up on that old Garmin you got. Okay? So if you're trying to use an old map of some place, and we know that every summer, every state in America sends the road workers out to build new roads somewhere. They do it because that's, you know, their summer job. So you're going to travel from here. Wayne, you guys are going to head out next week. You're going to travel from here to there, and you're going to use an old map to get out to the West Coast. I wouldn't do it. Okay? But you can trust this, because who knows the way to heaven but God? And that map is, what is that old uh, uh, bluegrass song? I'm using my Bible for a road map. You ever heard that song? Southern Rays used to sing that back when they were little. Okay? Anyway... Uh, he preserves the way of his saints. He's preserved his word. Proverbs twenty two twelve. The eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge, and he overthroweth the words of the transgressor. 
Psalm 100, verse 5, For the Lord is good, and His mercy is, is everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. Psalm 105, 10, watch this. He confirmed the same unto Jacob for a law, and to Israel for an everlasting covenant. Now let's get legal for a minute. Let's get technical. A covenant is a contract. And, it, and God likes to keep things simple. The Old Testament contract was, do the Ten Commandments, don't fail them one time, and I'll give you the promised land. That was the Old Covenant. They failed it. They failed it every single time. Every generation of Jew that God dealt with in the Old Testament days, all of them failed in keeping that covenant to where God finally wrote Israel a, a bill of divorce. And he said, I'm done with you. I'm done. I've, I've, I'm separating myself from you. So now, in Jeremiah 31, he promised that there would be a new covenant, not like the covenant that I made with your fathers at Mount Sinai. It's going to be a new covenant. In this covenant, I'm going to forgive your sins. This covenant doesn't say, do this and live. This covenant says, believe me and live. Believe what I said. Now here's the thing. The contract, the covenant that God gave to Paul 2,000 years ago, is it not still the exact same contract that you and I have? If you're going to claim that you're saved, but then you're going to say, the contract that God wrote in the beginning of the church days, there's words that are missing or words that are not right. How then can we trust the contract if God allowed it to be changed over the last 2,000 years? Have you ever been to the um, National Archive building, Washington, D.C.? You know what's there? copy of the Declaration of Independence, a copy of the original Constitution, and a copy of the Bill of Rights, these three documents. We spend a lot of money every year preserving those documents, don't we? Why? Because the same liberty that our forefathers were under must be the same liberty that you and I are under. The Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, in over 200 and some odd years, none of those words have been changed or altered. They are exactly the same. Amen? So when you start hearing politicians and public leaders start talking about changing the Constitution, I would be very concerned. Or you start hearing one of our presidents or one of our senators or one of our judges saying, we don't need the Constitution, or I'm above the Constitution, or we're going we're gonna to temporarily set the Constitution aside. I don't go for that. I don't think anybody in this church is violent, but would we not all stand up and be willing to fight to make sure that we, our rights are kept, our freedoms are kept. Amen? It's the same fight we're in when it comes to this contract. I'm not going to give you a right hook over it, but I will use what God has given me to boldly declare to everybody who will listen, this Bible is incorruptible in the words of the contract that God gave us. He has not altered them. And He has not allowed them to be altered. Man did that, not God. Evil men did that. You see it? Uh, everlasting covenant. The word pure in your Bible means holy. 
And the word holy means pure. Let me show you that. Exodus 30, 35, Thou shalt make it a perfume and a confection after the art of the apothecary, tempered together, pure and holy. What God says is pure is holy. What God says is holy is pure. Amen? See how simple that is? So, Psalm 12, verse 6, the words of the Lord are what? Pure words, which means they are holy words. See right there? What does that say? It is a declaration. If you're going to follow the words of the book and how they're defined, this means pure Bible. Okay? I, that's just sort of a, a phrase that I've been using for the last eight years doing this video ministry online is I started doing what's called a pure Bible study. Number one, because we're studying a Bible that we believe is pure. Number two, in doing the study, I'm not going to go outside of the Bible. We're going to stay in the Bible. We're going to keep it pure. Okay? Then we have software called what? Pure Bible software. Because what does it do? does nothing but let you search the scriptures and only the scriptures. We're not adding Greek and Hebrew in it. We're not adding Joe Blow's commentary or Dr. Uh, Clapjaw, Professor Clapjaw and his, his notes on it or Schofield or anybody else. It's just pure Bible search software. If you want to search what somebody else said, go online and search it. You want to search the Bible, we got the software for it. It's absolutely free. Hey, man, I like that. Pure means holy. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Turn there. Okay? Turn there. And I'm going to kind of close it out with, with this thought in your mind. Get you to understand the Bible that Paul used, the Bible that Timothy used, was not... The original manuscripts. Timothy did not have access to the original writings of Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Moses. He had copies. And we don't know 100% for sure. We know that Timothy was half Greek and half Jew. And I guess it would be a reasonable guess to think that Timothy spoke... Greek. Paul wrote to Timothy in Greek. So we would assume that Timothy's Bible that he read was in Greek. Look at what Paul called it. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 14, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known what? What does the word holy mean? Pure. Paul called the copy of the scriptures that Timothy read even as a child. Paul called them holy. Paul called them pure. See, I was even taught, Todd, that the reason why you see, you know, when the New Testament quotes the Old Testament, you'll see that it's different. And I was told that that's because Peter or Matthew was quoting from a corrupted translation. And that's why he didn't get it right. And I'm going, wait a minute. Peter said that these men wrote the words that the Holy Ghost gave them. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. He did not say anything about them Quoting from a corrupted Bible. He said that even when they were quoting the Old Testament. I'll give you an example. I won't, you don't have to turn there. But in Luke chapter 4, you go study this out. You, can, you compare what Jesus read in Luke 4 in the synagogue with Isaiah 61. And you'll see that there's differences. Jesus himself did it. And I don't think for a minute that Jesus would stand up in front of his people and read to them a corrupted Bible. He read the holy scriptures and said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. 
Okay? That from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. The Apostle Paul ascribed holiness and purity to something other than the original manuscripts. So if I believe that God preserved the word long enough for Timothy to have the Holy Scriptures, then I can believe that God then continued to preserve them long enough for us to have the Holy Scriptures. So do I believe that there's any mistakes in my Bible? Do I believe that it was translated wrong even one time? Do I believe that any of the words fell out? Do I believe that Somebody added words into the Bible, and now I have a corrupted Bible. I don't believe any of that. I believe my, the limit of my belief is exactly what the Bible says about the Bible and no more than what the Bible says about the Bible. Not allowed to believe anything else. Let's stand to our feet. The family of the Lord is pure. Thy word is very pure. The words of the pure are pleasant words. Every word of God is pure. That means they're holy. And if they're holy, they're pure. And they're pure, they're holy. If God cleansed you and sanctified you, He calls you His holy saint. Did you know that you don't have to wait for the Catholic Church to saint you in order to be a saint? You're one already, Wayne. Saint Wayne. Saint Jan. Oh, Jan's shaking her head. Jan, I'll tell you what... Huh? Yeah. Here's what God said to Peter. What I have cleansed, call not thou unclean. You, you know what I've, I've said about eating pig, right? God did not change the law. He cleaned the pig. He cleaned us pigs. Amen. Father in heaven, your word is right. It still is right. Men are the ones that are wrong. And Father, give us, give us the courage in these days when pastors don't believe it, when church people don't believe it, give us the courage to believe that every word is still holy and still pure. And Father, give us a sacred regard, a fear, a reverence for your holy words. Help us, dear God, to never corrupt them. Help us, dear God, to always revere them, respect them, fear them. Help us, dear God, to never take our Bibles and do anything vain with them. But help us, dear God, to always treat our Bibles with respect and reverence. And the world can accuse us all they want to of idolatry. We know that you and your word are inseparable. We know it. Our hearts are convinced of it. And we don't have a problem honoring your word. God, use us in these days of doubt and confusion to be the ones to keep your words and to keep those commandments. Father, thank you, Lord, for bringing us through this part of the week. Hold our hands and guide us through the remainder of the week and bring us back to the next appointed time. We love you and we trust you in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.